here to learn more about the I-90 project. I want you to know that this meeting is really to bring you up to speed for a meeting with Mass Stott with Nate over here. Uh, that will be April 13th at the Morse School. So today you'll be learning a lot. This is really an information meeting. There will be about 30 minutes for questions. But you'll have a lot more time to ask questions when we meet with Mass Dot on April 13th. I wanted to just give you a plug for our next CNA meeting uh, will be April 25th. So uh, put that on your calendar too. And if you haven't filled out uh, the survey yet about the CNA listserv, uh, please do that. We're trying to get feedback about the listserv, about how it could work better, whether it's working, whether we should be changing to another platform or not. Um, anyway, these are at the back of the room and we'll be posting them as well on the, on the listserv itself. Finally, the police wanted me to remind you that, uh, or to notify you that on Wednesday, April 19th, they're going to have a meeting about community, uh, about policing in a sanctuary city. So I will be posting that to the listserv tomorrow, uh, but just know that's coming up too and should be very, very interesting. Uh, today we're very lucky to have uh, Jack Walford over here uh, as our moderator. And to have Henrietta Davis and Bill Dignan, our, our I-90 reps for Cambridge, um, presenting and really leading with the show. Take it away, Jack. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I, uh, many of you here, I do the Cambridge tour myself with my partner Michael, who's uh, coming out to this uh, to get exposed to this huge project for his first time. But that's my first time. Um, I am. A, you, you need a mic? Okay. You need a mic. I need a mic. Can you hear me now? No. Oh, there we go. Work, work in the back? No. Right up here. Yes. Thank you. I feel like you should say your something. Go ahead. Um, I'm a mediator and arbitrator, facilitator, and, and maintain my neutrality on most of the issues related to this vast, complex, almost half a billion dollar project. The one thing where I need to disclose where I am an advocate is with respect to bike paths on the other side of the river, underpasses for bikes, joggers, and pedestrians under Anderson and in the future River and Western. But other than that, I'm maintaining my professional stance um, as a neutral, but I do live up the street on Cottage Street. Uh, about 45 years ago, also in a neutral capacity, I directed the Boston Transportation Planning Review, which among other things um, was the study that produced the governor, sergeants, decision not to build the inner belt that would have gone about one block from here. And I later, 25 years ago, um, mediated the issues over what was called Scheme Z, the new bridge across the Charles River, and um, the result of a 42-person stakeholder group is the Zakem Bunker Bridge. So I welcome you tonight. The agenda you have in hard copy, we're going to keep to the time limits, including me, thank you very much. And um, we're going to get an introduction to an overview of the issues from Henrietta, who is our community representative to the task force that you will hear about, that's been monitoring this big project. We're then going to deal with an overview of the project and deal with the three major alternatives for the turnpike. Thereafter, we'll have four presentations dealing with parkland and the riverfront, and finally, an Alston neighborhood perspective and consideration of Grand Junction, Kendall Square, things in the future, but that are related to this big project. So with that, Henrietta, you are on. Thanks, Jack, and I think we should all uh, be very um, 
uh, not respectful, but thankful to Jack for bringing his expertise to this project. He probably knows more about planning transportation projects than just about anybody in the state of Massachusetts. Yeah. So he's our guy. He's a little chill, but he lives in Cambridge for it. <laughs> and, and every project I've discovered is a learning exploration. Everyone is new, there are new issues, and so I learn every minute in this project. Great, well, I, uh, I only have three minutes, I think. So I'm going to quickly just say, I don't want to use them all either. I want to uh, first welcome City Council Jan Deborah, who's here listening to us this evening, and I, that's very helpful, Jan, that you're here. Um, and also Suzanne Matthewson and Stuart Dash from Community Development are here with us, and I don't know if, uh, if there are others of you that I should be recognizing. Raise your hand and I'll tell people you're here without listing every single one of you, which that's all good too. Uh, I am a newly uh, appointed member of the task force. I was appointed last fall. The task force has been meeting since 2014, uh, and I was appointed in uh, September, October. I've actually only been to one meeting of the task force, but I've been to two meetings, two community meetings that we've had in Cambridge Court so far, uh, led by Mass Dot and Nate Cabral, who's here with us. Uh, I'm going to just tell you what we've heard so far uh, that kind of frame the discussion for the evening. Uh, so far, we've heard from people in Cambridge Court that they're concerned about turnpike noise, they're concerned about what they hear from the turnpike now, and what they might hear in the future in any kind of rebuild. And you're going to hear that there are options for different kinds of rebuilds. Uh, people are concerned, we've heard, about access from the turnpike and from Star Drive. <coughs> as this project uh, is rebuilt, how those how the roadways are, are set up and uh, so on, uh, how we'll be able to drive there. And you know, of course, we're also very concerned about bikeways and pedestrian pathways. Uh, there's an opportunity for more parkland. There's a proposal for an addition, additional, I think, 25 acres. You'll hear more about that. Uh, are we happy with that? Do we want to know more about that? Uh, in addition, in the long run, uh, there's going to be development of the Grand Junction Railroad, we think, on the edges of Cambridge Port. How does this project have an impact on that? As the project goes forward, there'll be construction noise. This is what we've heard from you, that we need to be talking about this, and we need to be passing that, uh, those concerns on. And also, uh, West Station, the possibility of a new station on the other side of the river, kind of north, you've heard of South Station, North Station, West Station, I think East Station would be in the water, that's why there's not going to be an East Station. <laughs> but there could be a West Station, and the West Station would be near BU, and that's also something that's in the mix in this planning for this gigantic project that will take place across the, right across the river for Magazine Beach and all the way up to River Street and over quite a long way. Um, I don't know if other people have seen the drone of this area, but there is, I think, online the possibility to see what the whole area looks like, and that might be very helpful. So I'm here tonight, and Bill's here tonight specifically so that we can hear uh, all these concerns, but also to get you all prepped so you understand what the issues are. And we know this is going to be a kind of a speed dating experience, but it will help us to prepare for the meeting on the 13th. So uh, thank you all for coming, and now I turn it over to Bill Degden, who is uh, uh, going to give us the project overview. Bill. Okay, thanks, Henrietta. Um, so I have a lot that I've been assigned to talk about in a little bit of time, so I'm going to move quickly. Um, uh, can you go backwards? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk about an overview of the project. I'm going to talk about some of the issues involved with it. Um, also, one of the three alternatives that's getting looked at for the project and how it's laid out. And then some of the process and next steps. So here's the uh, project area in green. As you can see, uh, over here is Cambridge Port and Riverside Magazine Beach here. So this is right across the river from Cambridge. This triangular area is the project in question. Uh, we have Cambridge Street up here, Western Avenue is up at the top of the screen, and Soldiersville River Line River. So the purpose of the project, and this is mostly taken from MassDOT, this is how they're defining the purpose, is to really replace the elevated um, 
structural piece of I-90 viaduct that's obsolete right now. So in doing that, it gives them the opportunity to straighten out I-90 and also to uh, complete electronic tolling, which they're doing around the state, as well as rebuild uh, the interchange getting to and from the Mass Pike in Alston. Uh, it also gives the opportunity to realign Soldiers Field Road. I'll go into that a little bit more. Create a new grid of streets to, to serve the development uh, of Harvard because Harvard owns essentially most of that green triangle that you saw, except for what's uh, going to be roadways and railroad. Uh, create better connections from the Alston neighborhoods to the river. <clears throat> also construct some uh, improvements such as the People's Pipe, rebuild some pedestrian bridges in the area, and introduce multimodal facilities on many of the streets, including the cycle track on uh, Cambridge Street. And then there are a lot of uh, railroad yards in the area that are existing, so those will all be rebuilt. And one of the things that they're going to be doing is creating a layover area for MBTA commuter rail trains in, in the event that South Station does get expanded. This would introduce a new gear here for layover trains in that area. And then also the creation of West Station, as Henrietta mentioned, I think you'll hear more later, that would be the first uh, commuter rail station and then hopefully in the future build out as kind of a transit hub that could then connect over to Cambridge as well. So this is a uh, process that's been going on since 2014 meetings. And there have been 32 task force meetings that are of the entire group as well as subcommittees. Six public meetings that have been held in Alston and four, I think, including this one in Cambridge. Plus some site walks and other things. So the next big step in this project is the filing of the draft environmental impact report, the DEIR, which is expected this coming fall. And so really what we're talking about is what's going to be covered in the DEIR. And that has three alternatives that we're going to be talking about. I'm going to be describing the first one, and others will be describing the next two. And those are all going to be brought to the same level of design for analysis of at least these issues plus some others, noise, traffic, air quality, environmental justice, and economic development. So there'll be a lot of analysis in this document about each of those alternatives so people can judge them based on that data and then submit comments about that. So I'll start by talking about the 3K refined option, as it's called. And this option is really the kind of basis for all of the three options. The next two that you'll hear about are really just changes to kind of this area of the option, but the rest of it really remains the same. It's referred to as the refined option because about a year ago, the city of Boston made recommendations as part of a placemaking study that they were not happy with the option that existed then, so they made a series of recommendations, and MassDOT took them up on some of the recommendations, and so that's why it's called refined. It includes some of those recommendations. So what this is really is um, the existing mass pipe is in this area right here, it kind of blows out, blows out here with that Soldiers Field Road here. Western Avenue is up off the screen here, and then River Street. Uh, going over to Cambridge is here, of course, Cambridge Board down there. So this is really a whole series, new series of grid streets that are in what's now the Alston Rail Yards, essentially, along with the I-90 access. So just in reading this, the uh, yellow areas here are all at grade streets. <laughs> the blue are elevated streets kind of on fill, on a berm, and the red is essentially bridges. So West Station is raised up over railroad tracks here. This is the viaduct that's uh, existing and proposed to be rebuilt in this option. And then these are streets that are ground level and then sloping up and then going to a bridge and staying elevated essentially to get to West Station. <clears throat> so you'll, you'll see more of this and you'll probably uh, get how it all works. But So for, for people from Cambridge, like, let's just say getting to the Mass Pike, 
you know, now they come over from Western Avenue, they come down Soldiers Field Road, they got out of the mass pipe right here, and then they do the loop. I don't know, I'm not even sure what they do, but eventually you get on the mass pipe. <laughs> it's hard to follow. Um, in the future, there will be more options to get on the mass pipe. You can still come down Soldiers Field Road and take this street and come up and come down any of these streets onto, say, if you took this one, you'd come down and get onto the mass pipe westbound this way, or you could come down Cambridge Street and get on down here to go westbound as well. These streets up here are through Harvard property, and those, I believe, are now committed to by Harvard, but we'll wait and hear from uh, MassDOT in two weeks. But those would be additional ways that you could come down Western Avenue and Alston and get down into this grid of streets and get access to and from the turnpike as well. Getting going off the, way eastbound. Uh, going eastbound, let's see, there, there are two ways to do all of that. So you go, um, let's see, getting coming from the east, I know you go up here, and you can go there, you can get off, and you can go there. Or if you were wanting to go eastbound. If you're wanting to go eastbound, no, maybe you need to help me here. Go up the blues. Uh -huh. Go up the blues, up uh -huh. here, and then go eastbound again up there. I think we're going to poll questions. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to we're going to try to have that kind of exactly that kind of question, clarifying question, briefly after Bill mm -hmm. completes his summary, and uh, we'll do it. So there are pretty much, I believe, two ways to kind of do all of the moves, getting off and on in each direction. That was that was part of it. Um, let's see some other things here to point out. So. Um, I have some additional clarification uh, slides after this, so let's move on and we'll see if I've got anything. Okay, so I'm a little worried because we're at time. So, oh, we Jack, what's your That you was do? 10 minutes. Yeah, you want to moderate. Alexi is the timekeeper. Why don't you just quickly without reading it all? Okay, so, so there's there's uh, there's noise, there's a noise study that's ongoing now that we'll be getting more data on keep going, and it'll be covered in the DEIR. Uh, as Henrietta mentioned, Soldiers Field Road is getting realigned, and uh, there's going to be additional green space created. Keep going. It's going to be about, uh, I think, three to four acres total with two additional acres. Okay. One of the things that's of great access, uh, great interest to people in Cambridge is that Soldiers Field Road, when it gets realigned, is getting sunk down into a boat section right here in this purple. And as you come out Soldiers Field Road to actually uh, get into the neighborhood here, you'll take a left. And then up in here, the access ramp going from Soldiers Field Road over to River Street is being proposed to be taken away in this um, version to expand the green space up here and so what you do to get to Cambridge from Soldiers Field Road is take the left here go through this intersection and this intersection this intersection and over to River Street keep going so this also allows an at-grade bicycle pedestrian access to the green space and to the uh, Charles River from inside there in additional green space so this obviously has trade-offs for people and here they are. It allows more green space, better direct access to the river. It also redirects about 9,000 vehicles a day into the Alston neighborhood that are wanting to go to Cambridge and adds about three minutes of travel time to them. Um, so, as I said, the DEIR is getting filed in the fall. It will have to go through a final EIR and probably a Section 4F filing, which will be talked about later. Construction is anticipated to start in 2019. It's estimated about $460 million right now. So as I said, there's more noise data uh, being gathered that we're going to be reviewing, traffic model that we're going to be reviewing as well. Um, what we think is of great importance that's not being done as part of this project is the reconstruction of the river and western bridges which were brought to 100% design with uh, a lot better uh, access and bicycle pedestrian facilities across them and they were dropped from the MassDOT capital plan. 
So I would urge anyone who has an interest in those to contact your legislator or MassDOT and ask them to be put back on the program. Uh, and as we said, there's another meeting coming up April 13th at Morris Street. It's at 630 though. Oh, 630, sorry about that. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Uh, there was one other with, I thought there was a last slide actually about it. So, no, I guess it was, no, that was it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any clarifying questions to Bill about the overview? Not your views or uh, opinions, but just things to clarify. Then we're going to get to the three turnpike options, and after that, we will also break to have clarifying questions. So, yes, those, you could come up and roads that that will elaborate to now that might get to be the Cambridge, but so just go to those roads. What are those roads like? Mm -hmm. How many? How many um, lanes? Lanes that yeah, are that's traffic a good lights. And yep, good question. Um, so there are varying size, I think. Uh, I can't really go into it here without better graphics and cross sections, but um, they are quite they are quite large. They are actually meant in the future, I believe, to have Harvard put in some smaller streets in between them to break these blocks up. So there would be some smaller streets as well, but a lot of these are kind of four lane, you know, kind of arterial, more collector arterial type roads. And they have, um, especially at the intersections, I think they're they're fairly large. And then they have, you know, generally uh, either a bike lane or a separated cycle track, um, which make make them a little wider. But again, this is kind of the superstructure of the grid, and there, it is supposed to be a smaller grid within those blocks. And there's traffic lights on each of those roads. Yeah, it uh, in each of these areas, that's all a traffic light. That little simple area. So let's come to this side. Yes. <clears throat> Stand up and then speak loudly. Um, I noticed that you didn't point out again that Soldiers Field Road um, will, in order to get that extra space, um, divert. You, you said that the traffic would be diverted to um, another route, but you did not point out that it would be merged with the Mass Pike exiting traffic. And that is a piece of information that people should be aware of. Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, please verify that. Yeah, in the, um, the option here, it will be coming, the traffic will be coming off the pike here in the kind of uh, westbound direction. Um, and so traffic coming up to the road wanting to go to Cambridge will have to take turns with it at that traffic signal as so it wants to go back. Oh. Those streets in that, that grid have, as I think about it, four functions, and whether they all fit together is an open question. There's to and from Soldiers Field Road, to and from the pike, there's access to the future Harvard development parcels, and there are neighborhood streets and the concerns of the Alston people for not huge boulevards. So there's a mix of functions and they haven't been worked out yet. So, so. but when you say will, Bill, when you say will be um, mm -hmm. removed and diverted, does that mean that it will or is that still a possibility? No, it's open for discussion. I mean will in this option, but it's oh, the DEIR okay. is looking at other things and I think at the last meeting we had here in this room where MassDOT was there that that was not decided, that they were open to comments, so they wanted to hear what people thought of it. Question from this side. Yes, the, the DEIR... Could you stand up, please? Thank you. So the DEIR was filed last fall? No. no the date was, was 2016. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Thank you. Very important clarification. Any questions on this side, and we're going to move on. Yes. Yeah. Would this impact any traffic going on? Can't the hear you. Would this Sorry. impact any traffic going over the VU bridge? Over the VU bridge. Um, we're not entirely positive about that. MassDOT does not think so, but there is a, tra a regional traffic model that's been done, 
that has just been completed, and we actually have a meeting set up with NASDAQ to go over that. So it's something that we're going to be looking at more. So is there any more clarifying questions? Because I want to move on to the three pike options in what's called the throat, in the rear. Yes? Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't do the whole presentation, but part of the problem with the current configuration, could you think of yeah. the problem with the configuration is acoustic. I mean, it's really noisy. You can hear it throughout the neighborhood. Um, what's you know what's going to be the result of this in terms of the acoustic issues? Well, the, the noise is going to be steady, but also when we get to the three turnpike options, that that factor in all three uh, will be addressed in the, coming up tonight. It will be. I don't think. I don't think there will be anything shown tonight that's definitive about the noise. But each of the three options is getting studied for noise, and that will be in the DEIR. We'll, that will be looked at for each one. Last question over here. So I have a very uh, personal question. I live in Jamesport, obviously. Could you um, stand up? Too? I live on Chestnut Street, which is a two-way street that is the best cut through. Yes, and people are currently are going about 40 miles an hour when they go past my house right in the middle uh, between Maxine and Pearl. Is there anything in this uh, new design to mitigate the traffic that's coming through Cambridgeport? Because more cars, more development, more you know, on the sides, and, you know, MIT means more traffic coming, plowing down Cambridge yeah. Chestnut Street. Uh, there, there's nothing in this particular project. Everything that's happening here is happening either in Alston or maybe in some of the intersections along the Cambridge side that would not be going into the Cambridgeport neighborhood. There are other things that the city of Cambridge might be able to do that, that could be looked at and you know, we can talk further, but uh, this project itself is not going to be looking at any of the residential streets in Cambridge. So I'm gonna cut questions off at this point and go right to the turnpike option. Do you want to describe 3K and then? I think I did describe 3K. You did, yeah. fine. Tom, you're Tom Nally of A Better City uh, has developed an at-grade option for the pike, and he's going to describe that now. And then we'll have Ari, who created a different option, present that. And then after those two options are presented, we'll have another period for clarifying questions. Thanks, Jack. I want to take all the credit of Len, Len Berkowitz, who's also co-author of this week. Indeed. Uh, and I'm not going to focus exclusively on the attributes uh, of the option that we have developed. Uh, Bill's done a great job providing the context. I'm not going to jump back to that. I'll just talk about the attributes. Uh, in this slide, you can see that all the transportation facilities are located at grade across a 200-foot wide which is the narrow section of the throat. Uh, and uh, this is, in our proposal, everything is at grade. And it, it uh, resides between the property line of Boston University and the bank of the Charles River. The turnpike remains essentially flat in this option, uh, all the way from underneath Commonwealth Avenue, uh, all the way across the, the entire site uh, over to Cambridge Street. Next slide, please. Um, this is the uh, section uh, through the narrowest point. Uh, the dimensions are, again, at the narrowest point. Um, and we have a, a number of things that are, go beyond this. Uh, the Grand Junction, at some point, needs to go over the, the turnpike in order to connect uh, to the bridge across the river. Uh, the um, dimension here uh, assumes that seven and a half feet of uh, the property uh, that's owned by Boston University is used for uh, a to accommodate uh, easement for a portion of this. Uh, we have looked at 14 feet. Uh, 14 feet doesn't work because of the geometry that's necessary for the railroad track uh, to align further down the way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this shows the very narrow, and we admit, admittedly that this is under what it should be, uh, but in order to accommodate the space between the edge of the, the, the river, uh, the edge of the water sheet, which is shown here, uh, and the property line uh, extending into BU, uh, it's necessary to have a very constrained, admittedly very constrained, hot dumping white cap. Um, all the other, other dimensions are set 
uh, by the requirements for the transportation facilities. Uh, I want to point out uh, that there, you will see in a few minutes uh, some options for how to improve the edge of the river, uh, which go beyond the edge of where the water is today. Uh, and I would just point out that what we have shown is we stop at the edge of the river, and this is compatible with a number of the different ideas that you will see in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also want to point out, uh, and just note, uh, that the narrowest constrained portion shown in yellow here is a relatively small portion of the distance of the bank uh, between the BU Bridge uh, and the River Street Bridge. Next slide, please. Uh, there are some dimensions which I will not go into great detail other than to say uh, these are some kind of, uh, moving parts. Uh, a lot of things are changing uh, as we refine this, but I will say that we have since learned uh, that the curb to curb dimension of the eastbound and westbound lanes of the turnpike is 48 feet. Uh, we're not going through the details here, we also have assumed 48 feet. Uh, the question is what are the dimensions of the lane, what the lane widths, what are the dimensions of the shoulders on the inside and outside. Uh, there's some play there. Uh, the uh, mascot would like to see wider shoulders than we have shown. However, our shoulders can match what exists today uh, in the connection between the credential tunnel and this location. Uh, the shoulders, we are just debating what the dimensions actually are, but they're in the range of two to four feet. Uh, that doesn't provide much space for either snow removal or drainage, but it does work with the drainage system that's in place there uh, today in that area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, please. Uh, we have uh, gone through very narrow lanes, uh, and uh, we have discovered that Federal Highway has improved such narrow lanes uh, in Milwaukee, uh, where the I-94 is being rebuilt in between two um, cemeteries where they're very constrained, and they have improved the same width lanes that we're seeing. The next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, identified uh, locations where uh, as the dimension spreads, uh, it's easier to get structure in between uh, the, uh, the medians uh, and uh, release the location at either end of the throat where it's easy to build over uh, and build structure uh, for air rights to make a better connection to the river. Next slide, please. Uh, cost is much less and has been determined by the analysis that's been done. Uh, much less to build that way, both from a, a, a initial construction uh, and for an ongoing uh, life cycle. Uh, we don't know what the numbers are. However, in Milwaukee, the example shows uh, three times the cost uh, for building a viaduct than building a grade. Thank you. Tom, do you want to just show how you, your plan depresses the pipe to deal in part with the noise issue? That uh, the next slide, please. Uh, what we have here is, uh, in order to address the noise issue, which we heard mentioned, uh, we are suggesting at least uh, changing the profile to some extent, the cross-section, uh, so that uh, the uh, Salt-Field Road is raised up a few feet uh, to provide uh, some screening between the real noise that's generated on the turnpike, which is much greater than any noise that you get because there are trucks there. Uh, more more noisy than you get on Soap Field Road. And we think this is a way of, of doing sunscreen. We've also looked at uh, various transparent noise barriers that could take place in this location. Uh, 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 I just wanted to add one thing to the noise. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Just wanted to add one thing about the noise, which is, as was said a few minutes ago, the state did say that they're going to evaluate the noise impacts of these different options. That said, it seems sort of common sense that if you put trucks and high-speed interstate traffic up in the air on the, south, on the south side of the Charles River, the noise is gonna filter across the river to the Cambridgeport community uh, more than if the highway was down on the ground. And, uh, there's a number of people in here who've been part of the task force that the state put together for the last three years. At the very uh, first meeting of the task force, people said, 
uh, you know, why can't you put this at grade? And the answer was, we can't. Not that um, uh, the pros and the cons don't you know, match up with itself. And I think what Tom just tried to show is that you can put this uh, highway at grade. This is the hook. Oh. Uh, and if it's at grade, I was rolling it to use when necessary. Yeah, and if the highways at grade is all I'm trying to say is I think it's pretty obvious that the noise impacts on the Cambridge Court community will go down. They won't increase. Thank you. Ari, Thanks, any more you questions? Are, um, we'll, we'll have questions for all three of you okay. together on the three options, if that's okay. Um, Jack, while you're waiting for Ari, I just want to bring attention to my dear husband, Sam Kendall, who's doing the technology behind the Alexi Cadetti, who is the tough guy who's holding up the two minute, one minute, 30 second songs. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, I have four slides, and I'm going to try to get through them in four minutes. I'll use the mic. Sorry, oh. Uh, <laughs> Alright, I have four slides and I'm trying to get through the four minutes and not break any microphone. Um, what, I, what I sort of did is a thought experiment of can you get, and Harry Madison was here was sort of the instigator of this, can you get everything at grade in the current envelope? And the answer was no, not really, but if you look at the how, if you, if you notice, the, the railroad come, when, when F -half comes under the B bridge is above where the highway is, and then they sort of switch, and it seems silly to switch them. I mean, the question was, what if the railroad was up and the highway was down? Um, so this has a lot of benefits. And I would say that a lot of what, what my plan and, and the ABC plan that you just heard from, there are a lot of similar elements. I think one thing that um, maybe wasn't mentioned in the ABC plan and could take place either in my plan or, or that plan is that you would actually have some kind of cap over the, uh, over the highway that would also decrease highway noise. Um, that's something that may be possible with both of them. Um, well, what we're looking at is, is um, what, what are the benefits of having the traffic? Uh, well, it's cheaper to build because you don't have to build as extensive of a viaduct in this plan where you would have the railroad above and the highway below. Um, the trucks that, 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 that we hear in Cambridge, where I live about five blocks that way, and when the windows open in the summer, I can hear it, and I'm still several blocks from the river. Um, the trucks are no longer going up and down those grades to get up onto the viaduct and to come down, so you would have some mitigation of that noise. Um, by pulling the viaduct back from the river, you don't have a 40-foot viaduct uh, over that, that the state would be planning to move 30 feet closer to the river, overshadowing the river and it, literally shadowing the river and uh, sort of theoretically, figuratively shadowing Cambridge Port. So you wouldn't look across from from Magazine Beach and sort of see a viaduct. Um, and then there would there be allows for some increase in parkland near the U Bridge. So. Really quickly, what I sort of show here is this is sort of the, you can actually see where I live because the little blue dot on Google is, is <laughs> um, And I know, so that means there are a lot of people who are closer and you can sort of see, I, I just put a couple of things in here. The yellow arrows are right now where there are currently and whether it would be proposed upgrades. So a four or five percent upgrade with a truck going up it or down it if they're braking is a pretty significant amount of noise and you can sort of see how it, it Cambridge Port sort of points in that direction. What the other piece is the green the green uh, dashed line is where the railroad would would be so it would come up and, and it would be up above as instead now there is the question of well, are railroad, railroad railroad trains going to be up there yes they are going to be but they would be on a flat ground so they would generally be posting and you know given that the fact that the freight uh, movements there are very minimal um, if there were passenger services in Cambridge and those were either DMUs or preferably electric vehicles then they're 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 quite quiet. Uh, but the other thing that that allows is on either side of that, you could put in a pedestrian walkway to get people back and forth. Um, so you could, in addition to crossing the Grand Junction Bridge, it would allow connections to be made to BU and into Alston and all, all through, through the Alston area so that it wouldn't, right now, if, you, if you're on that side of the river, there's more than a mile that you go on the river without being able to get to the way. So um, what are the, the connections to Cambridge? Well, the Grand Junction would be built uh, above the turnpike but it would be quite a bit set back from the river. Um, I think what you would do, especially the Grand Junction, it's you don't have to worry as much about snow removal, so you could really put up sound barriers along the side, and they could be green. What I mean by green is that they wouldn't be painted green, but there's enough room on either side to have some soil, to have some 
either ivy or maybe some trees that sort of would screen that from the river. So you would, if you looked across, instead of seeing a highway, you would, you would have the room to basically put up something that it would look, uh, maybe it wouldn't look like a riverbank, but at least it wouldn't, wouldn't look like a highway over that either. Um, both of the accurate plans have much better well, bike blocks and connectivity at Alston and VU and Cambridge. So what that actually I think helps with is some traffic so that someone who might be getting in an Uber might be driving across the VU bridge if they had a better connection might make that as a walk. Not going to be everyone, but it might be some people. And then there is the potential I think for rail shuttle service uh, to Kendall Square. What this really does is it reduces the number of cars coming through Cambridge. Right now, and, and I actually have some data for this, I didn't, don't, don't, not going to go into it here because it's like a bunch of spreadsheets, but the number of people who are coming from the west, if you look at people who are coming from sort of the south, uh, um, like Attleboro, 80% of them are taking public transport. If you look at places like Acton that have pretty good connections, 50% of people who work in Kendall are taking public transportation. From the west, it's only 20%. And that's because there's no good connection from the west to Cambridge. So we have the businesses in Cambridge, we have that employee base, and it would allow us to take some of those people who are right now getting off the turnpike, getting on River Street, coming through Chestnut Street, coming down Memorial Drive, coming through Cambridgeport, one way or another. I live on Lawrence, which is one block long, and it's a cut through room. We have now raised intersections on both sides, but there's a lot of people who come down that street, it's a tiny little street. So I think that allows you to try to move some of that traffic out. So that's, I think, another piece. So, yep. Thanks. That's it. In planning this meeting, um, as they say in uh, congressional hearings, with all due respect to the DOT meeting uh, that Nate was intimately involved in, we wanted specifically to give the proponents of these two at grade options the opportunity to present their options and respond to questions. So let's go with questions. Tom, I think you had a, a comment. And then I want to have one more point of clarification. Uh, this is all a game of numbers. I didn't go into a lot of detail, but I will say, again, between the property line of BU and the edge of the river, uh, it's 200 feet. The width of the, of the cross section is 224 feet in the option that we have shown. In order to gain the extra 24 feet, that we need to have seven and a half feet uh, on the edge of BU property, uh, which is dictated again by the geometry of the railroad tracks. Uh, and we need another, um, was 14 feet, uh, 17 feet, um, to the edge of the water. Uh, the 200 foot dimension is at the top of the bank, uh, and it's about 12 to 17 feet, it varies, from the top of the bank to the edge of the water sheet. In order to fit that in and work within those constraints, uh, those are the critical dimensions. That does not allow room for structure in the narrowest part of the throw uh, to accommodate a structure for a deck over that portion of it. What I showed you in the slide very quickly was at the eastern end and the western end of the throw, uh, where the uh, property line and the edge of the river <coughs> diverge, there is space there to build decks uh, and build a structure for decks, but not in the narrow part. That's the clarification I want to make. So in what we have shown, unless the dimensions change somehow, and it may, uh, we're not able to deck over that middle portion. And Tom, let me ask a question. Am I right that BU has said that instead of the steep slant of their property line, they're willing to provide that additional, is it 10 feet? Yeah, Boston if University. there were a, an at-grade option selected. In order to accommodate that, there is, a, we looked at about 14 feet of their property would be necessary. It would mean uh, taking a portion of an unused building uh, and moving a fire escape on their fine arts building. Uh, but that could move the, the edge of the railroad track right away uh, onto their property with an easement. Uh, I will also clarify that the that Harvard owns all the land in the middle here. There's a transportation easement, uh, and this would be a similar kind of easement um, as the as Mascot has uh, that they would have would be you as they have for Harvard. So that's the clarification. Some clarifying questions to these folks. Yes, could you stand up? Thanks. When you said that you that you wouldn't be able to deck over the edge of the river to gain that space, does that mean the whole that is like? Track yeah, we, at that point. we can deck over portions of it and make a better connection to Paul Dudley White. Uh, we could uh, 
and you'll see in a few minutes some options that other people have generated that are compatible with what we've shown that could increase the size of Paul Dudley White or duplicate Paul Dudley White, separate pedestrians from bicycles. We're not advocating that because we are concerned about the permitting process of working with the river. But if others want to take that on, we'd be very supportive of that. And you avoid the river except that you have a cantilevered section going out of the river. It's actually not river. cantilevered. It was cantilevered. It's now filled it's with a structure uh, and a vertical seawall as exists close to River Street. Similar kind of detail in this narrow part of the throat. Um, and um, it's not an ideal situation, but it's what keeps you out of watch. Question over here. When you talk about the different... Stand up, if you would. When you talk about the different options and noise, are you talking about just the traffic noise, or are you considering also the, the, the rail noise down the road? Well, the rails uh, vary in, in elevation. In some places, they're as low as the, as the bottom of the, of the roadway. And in some places, they start to rise up, as is shown in the section that we have here. Um, and some of that rail noise, um, uh, as it is today, is, is, is open and not covered in that middle But portion. I'm wondering, when you do some kind of environmental assessment or assessment of all of this, would you come up with some number? I will not, but hopefully mass stop. But when they come up with a number, is that number, whatever it is, measurement, going to be based on what? On what kind of transportation? Cars or rail and cars? I assume it's based on everything that's in the cross section. Uh, and I'm not an expert in noise, and I'm not writing the report, so I can't tell you what they're going to do exactly. And Nate has just been writing that question down. So. <laughs> okay, and and, and I'm, I'm loath to speak this evening because it's not my show, um, but uh, there is... Could you stand up? <laughs> I'm loath to speak this evening because it's not my show, um, but if you wish, ma'am, um, before I came here tonight, I made sure that the uh, meeting minutes and presentation from the 11917 meeting with this group have now been posted to the MassDOT site. So there is a description in there uh, from the sound engineer who will be doing the analysis of how that analysis will be done. And you can go read that and see the slides that are uh, regarding it. And at the public have? meeting, there was a lot of discussion about exactly your question. What are the assumptions? What are you looking at? Where are you measuring it from the second or third floor on the Cambridge side or lower down? I mean, lots of intricacies that have a a major impact on the conclusions. So, good question. Just another clarification. Uh, we are not authors of the overall report. We are suggesting uh, an option that we think is a better option that we will be included in the report as we specify it. Um, uh, better City represents our members, including Boston University, uh, including uh, Harvard, including a number of other uh, abutters. So, uh, in truth and in advertising, we are looking out for their interests as well as the greater interests that we think are important for transportation, the environment, and the neighborhoods. So, one more question here, and then we're going to go to the other four presentations about the riverfront. James. Um, so, thanks. Uh, just to clarify uh, a, a notion that I understand some people have put forward, where you, at the various presenters, how it this does or doesn't fit into what you're presenting and or your views on it. There is a notion of expanding landfill out into the Charles River by about 20 feet to accommodate additional green space along the edge of the river. Um, of course, it raises questions about possibly permitting and other issues. So can you speak we're to- We're gonna hear a bit about that in the next presentation. But if any of you want to speak to- We have to with any of those ideas. Sorry? We are compatible with those ideas. We've chosen to stop at the edge of the river because we're concerned, as Mastod is, about the permitting process. However, it doesn't mean that as part of the process or in the future, that expansion could take place with the option that we have suggested. I have a question on this. Sort of so I'm going to move us right along to the floor. <laughs> we're either for or against it. Renata, you are on. Thank you. Charles River Conservancy. And I, my notes said, get to this point at 7.50, so we're at 7.50. Well, my name is Renata von Schorner, and the Charles River Conservancy, we are a non-profit advocacy group, and our mission is making parklands active, attractive, and accessible. And now that we understand better what the options are, next picture please, 
Um, we're looking obviously here at the <coughs> piece of land that is absolutely central to the Charles River, to the city, and instead of having a spaghetti land, a no man's land, we're going to have a city with streets. Next one. Um, you see this picture. What we are advocating for our three mission points, next one, um, is in order to make the parklands and the river more active and attractive, to create a usable green space for recreation and celebrations. And right now, I think Henry mentioned 20, or somebody mentioned 25 acres, I think it's 2.5 acres, <laughs> but we are. We would love to see something more along this here, something that allows real recreation to happen there, celebrations, where there could be celebrations on the border between Magazine Beach and the Olsen Esplanade. We feel it's important that this not just be a thin green stripe, but really <coughs> a usable space both for recreation and for civic activities. So we really want to see that space expanding. Next one. Um, and in, we also advocate for removing the viaduct. That would be the version that Mass DOT is proposing is the viaduct, keeping the viaduct and having an at-grade version because it reduces the cost. It's at 320 to 115 million enormous reduces the impact of the river, the shadow, the noise, the barrier, and um, a great impact on Cambridge. Next one. Um, removing the viaduct does these things, but also something that hasn't been mentioned in the other presentations. It suddenly, uh, next picture, um, the, this red Chinese wall, which right now doesn't allow people at BU or in, in Brookheim to come to the river um, to have overpasses there. And I think Tom showed two areas. So it will be possible to have a way to connect <coughs> BU campus and, and Brookline with the river, which I think is very important right now. They're completely cut off from the Charles River. Next one. Um, we also are interested in connectivity along the river um, for the last nine years with the help of, of Jack Wofford. We've been advocating for underpasses and to have a connection along the river. Um, Mass DOT has now a design team working on it and we are 25% at the Anderson Bridge but obviously we also would like the River Street and the West Avenue Bridge to have underpasses next one. And um, this is what uh, is being proposed for the Anderson Bridge. The pipes have already been removed. Mass Historical Commission has already uh, said that they are, this, the adverse effect is not a problem. So we are moving forward with that. Next one. Um, our letter to Mass DOT can be found on our website at the charles.org. So mm -hmm. I just kind of uh, summarized the major points, and I'd be glad to answer more We're questions. We've got all the questions still. We have all four all right. together. So Bob Sloan of Walk Foss is on. Thank you, Renata. Thank you. I'm Bob Sloan, and I work for Walk Foss Camp, and I've been to make the walking safer and better for everybody. Chris Clark? Please speak up. Please speak up. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're, we're talking about parks and just the throat in this case. And you can see here that there are, um, not, this is just to show there are users there. Uh, I can't hear you. I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah. Speak into the mic. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Keep it there. Speak to, Keep it there. Speak to me back here. Okay, got it. Thank All right. <laughs> the largest number of users are in this part of the park. And you'll see it in the next slide. Uh, it shows the way it's broken down. The weekday and weekend. The uh, majority of the people using the park are on foot. Uh, and because of that, we are talking now about having dual paths. Paths for people on foot and people on bikes. Okay? The one example that's been done is an excellent one. It's just been underway recently by DGR in, in Cambridge, in front of MIT. This shows the construction underway. We're planting the grass this week, so it's going to be finished very short, shortly. That's a magnificent example. It has an asphalt path for bikes, and it has a granular um, uh, 
compacted granite, granite and stone, a place where people can run so it's softer on the edge uh, next to the water and that. One of the things we've been working on in Walt Boston is trying to figure out if there's a way to have dual paths for the full length of this busy part of the South Charles River Basin. We have a contract right now, we're working with the Esplanade Association to set up dual paths on the Esplanade, and we are worried about the, the part in Austin, and that's the part that's affected most directly by our name. One of the things that's happening in that is the park has been mentioned already. The park is big enough for dual paths, so that part is good. Next. That park ends, as you can see, on the far left here, and there's a, a, a gaping hole in between the park that's proposed and the existing end of the uh, Esplanade on the right. So the, the distance here is something between 1,600 and 1,800 feet, but there's nothing planned in the way of park there at all much less dual path. Yes. The park that's there right now consists of this path and the riprap going down into water. And that is, in fact, what's being taken further into the options that we are now looking at for this road. Yes. The viaduct option has a section of the, the park where there only be an eight-foot path. The other options also have the same problem of having an option that is a very, very narrow path. A single narrow path means that adding dual paths on anything in the way of a park is virtually impossible. We have an option, and that is that you could fill the river modestly. It's been done before, it's been done over 400 years in Boston, and now a 5,000 acres that we filled with the harbor, 700 acres in the, in the back bay alone, and there were seven acres. The most recent thing that's been added is seven acres when we built the Star Wars next to the Esplanade. A small amount of film river would really connect the missing river link, the missing link, and connect the park that now exists from uh, the Esplanade down to the new park that's going to be built as part of the INAM project. Next. The river here is 500 feet wide. The proposal I'm making is 50, it's arbitrary, it could be 30, it could be 20, uh, but that would be a, a small amount of fill in a 500 foot wide park. This is what it might look like. Path. The cross section at the top is what exists right now and what's being carried forward in all of the plan. The one below would be what might be added if you had to fill. Again, we're representing here that the social road would be raised somewhat uh, above the park and the park would sort of taper down into the water's edge. The advantages of the park are listed here. I won't go through them because we've only got 30 seconds left. Next. But one of the problems we have is that the park and the roadways are not being studied together at all. And they're not going to be until the DIR is finished. And that, I think, is a major, major problem with the park that's in the process that's going on right now. We're not being able, being allowed to look at what the park might do to assuage some of the impacts of the highway proposal. Thank you. Good evening. I decided in four minutes I was not going to prepare a slideshow, so you have to look at me, and uh, hopefully that will satisfy you for four minutes. Uh, I am Kate Bowders from Charles River Watershed Association, and uh, we're mostly involved in this project from the perspective of the river itself. Uh, as many people have already talked about, we have both opportunities and challenges with this project, in particular in the throat area. It's very, very tough to do this project there for lots of reasons. Uh, we've been focusing primarily on obviously avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating negative impacts, and also trying to look at this project for opportunities to improve existing conditions out there. As most of you probably know, if you're from the Cambridgeport area, this whole section of the river on the Alston side uh, has terrible, poor quality parklands. Lots of people are, have talked about that. Uh, very poor quality habitat for our thriving and recovering fish species, uh, which is definitely something we're really focused on at Charles River Watershed. And obviously water quality impacts, both from the existing design of the banks there, and in fact, sort of the whole edge of many, many parts of the whole lower basin, and also because of really significant stormwater runoff impacts. 
If you're familiar with that area, you've seen the boomed outfalls. There are uh, over 20 stormwater outfalls from the various highway systems and paved areas that come out to the Charles Deere. All of these need to be looked at and addressed as part of this process. They will be looked at uh, for all three of the designs that are going into the environmental impact review process. So we're really looking in particular, uh, obviously, at the parklands and supporting better parklands, but the banks uh, are a big, big issue for us. We're, we're, you know, we hear lots of people um, talking about the potential to uh, change the way the bank is currently designed, and certainly if that's going to happen, it needs to significantly improve conditions in the Charles, not just keep them the same as they are now or make them worse. Uh, so that's really one of the things, uh, all the permits are very clear that that's a requirement of making a change like that. Uh, and so that's really the, the main thing I think uh, that I want to emphasize that Trouble River Watershed Association is, is really looking at in this is if we're going to change the way the current system over there works, and I think it's pretty unavoidable that this project will have some impacts, those impacts need to be positive and we need to make sure that any changes that are made, particularly to the design of the banks and the edge of the river there, has a positive impact on water quality, on habitat, uh, is going to be resilient and resistant to floods. We have all kinds of flooding issues in this area, as many of you who may have worked on Cambridge's Climate Resilience Report will have seen the flood mapping that extends all the way into this area. So there's quite a lot of design issues uh, quite a, there are quite a few design issues that will have to be looked at, and uh, I'm not going to go on anymore. I basically just wanted to make people aware of the fact that uh, a hard edge of a river is a bad thing. And so whatever happens, we need to be moving away from designs that rely on a really hard edge, because that's a step backwards, not a step forward. Thank you. I will, I will just add, um, it, from my experience as the Deputy General Counsel of USDOT, all the parkland uh, issues came across my desk on the way to the Secretary for his approval. And the policy at that time was to use the environmental uh, requirements, not as dumbing things down and avoiding it, but to use them as an opportunity to improve the environment. And that's really what I heard Kate saying there at the end, and I think what all the folks concerned about the river feel, that the various federal and state permitting requirements, they could keep things narrower and narrower and narrower and avoid this piece of park or that piece, but the park is going to be impacted one way or another. So use it to the best benefit you can to get the best results for the park lands. And the river. <laughs> well, I include the river in the park now because it's part of the scenic. John Shield for four minutes. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, Charles River Alliance. Charles River Alliance. One thing that when you started this this project and you look at, at what is out there and where am I here on this okay um, I'm sorry okay. Uh, people have not been looking at this area at this area in a way that uh, I think we should be looking at it. We should not be looking at it as a, a highway project, the development, the things are going to happen around the highway construction. I think we should be looking at the resource of the river as a place to start. And I think that it's an incredible resource, and we should be thinking about this, this site first as a riverfront site that is going to be a highly urbanized area. And so we've um, put this slide together which shows uh, just generally what uh, we think could, could happen if we thought about the river park as incorporating both Austin Landing, the river, and Magazine Beach, and that this would be a, 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 a park with a river that runs through it, uh, rather than a road beside it.
Why is that not turning? Okay. Uh, I'm just the rest of my presentation. Uh, I've got a bunch more slides, but maybe the discussion period. But I wanted you to see something. This is Columbus Old by Green Space. Boulevards, bikeways, and pedestrian paths. The Scioto Mile is a nationally recognized, award winning urban oasis, visited by over 1 million people a year. A beloved civic asset, it plays host to festivals, concerts, and community events year round. But the Scioto River and its surroundings weren't always the amenity they are today. Not long ago, the river itself was a slow-moving, overly wide pool of sediment-laden water. Atop its walled boundary stood Civic Center Drive, a five-lane urban highway. So in 2008, the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation was tasked with executing a transformative new vision for the riverfront. After converting Civic Center Drive to a two-way street, CDDC led the design and construction of a new riverfront promenade and park. The promenade would stretch along the river's east bank, connecting Mattel Riverfront Park and Bicentennial Park, and feature a stone colonnade with shaded swings, fountains, and beautiful gardens. The southern end of the promenade would feature a completely redesigned Bicentennial Park. The park would be updated to include an impressive 15,000 square foot fountain with state-of-the-art lighting and events. Milestone 229, a brand new restaurant offering stunning views of the Columbus skyline and an eye-catching band shell, hosting an eclectic array of touring artists, local musicians, and arts organizations. With these elements in place, the riverfront was completely transformed from its former lifeless state into a year-round destination. But CDDC didn't stop there. During the construction of the Scioto Mile, attention shifted westward to the river itself, and the Scioto Greenways project was born. The incredibly ambitious plan consisted of three primary components. Removal of the Main Street Dam to allow the river to flow naturally, which would restore the channel to its natural width, allowing for the creation of 33 acres of active, exciting green space in the heart of downtown. Completed on time and on budget, the Scioto Greenways was officially open to the public to rave reviews in November 2015. Today, the Scioto Mile is a stunning example of the type of successful public-private partnership for which CDEC is known. And it has, along with the Columbus Commons, served as a catalyst for the spectacular urban renaissance occurring in downtown Columbus. Hundreds of millions of dollars in private mixed-use development has occurred around the parks in the years since, with new projects being announced to this day. The Scioto Mile, a riverfront transformed. So we have this setting, and this setting is actually big or as big or bigger as the, uh, the head in Columbus, and the potential is greater. And I think it's just really uh, up to us to sort of think a little differently. Uh, we've been developing, uh, our, our vision committee has been developing uh, concept plans. There's materials on the back of the wall, uh, we've been thinking uh, in concept and in detail. Uh, and I hope to talk to you during the discussion. Thank you, John. All right, if you come up, come on up, and um, Kate, and Renata, and yes, Henrietta. I have a question for them all. Can yes, I that's why I want them all right up here. So I have clarifying questions. Henrietta is first. My, my first question is, do you end up? Oh, sorry. Do, do, my first question is, is, do your um, you're in all sides of you. Yeah, come on okay. right into the center. <laughs> yes, come on the center. So the, uh, do, your, do all the things that you have proposed work with the three options for the roadway? Are they consistent? And Bob, can yours work with viaduct up, viaduct down? Do these all, and yours, Renata, are they all consistent with the roadway options that we're hearing about? I have not seen the plan for the three of us. Is the plan I've not seen the plan. I think what I proposed works for all three. Uh, yes, ours uh, would work with all three, as you can see in the detail. There's not much detail there. Uh, but the idea uh, would work with all three, but we prefer the ad grade scheme. It will work better. But it's like a, uh, making an omelet. 
there are days that you've got to break to do it, and uh, uh, there can be one. We don't have a plan, so I think it's not, I can't answer. I think we obviously prefer to add grade one, and then um, as, as Bob Sloan said, uh, we want Mass DOT to study um, the possibilities for the pathway and the parks. That should be part of the study of how it would impact the shoreline, what are the mitigation possibilities, how can we improve the shoreline um, while we also have pathways. So we want Mass DOT to study that. Renata. All right, let's have two more questions and then we're going to go to the next, the gentleman in the room. Did you have your chance? I'll be right back to you. Okay. Question for the better city people. A question for the better city people. My understanding is that next to the throat, you have a, you have a walk path and bike path, which is above a natural grade, which is an animal habitat. You're talking about doing a lot less hill than many of the others. But would it be accurate to say that you're destroying a natural grade and putting in a vertical support at that level and you expand it beyond the vertical supported points? Thank you. You're replacing the riprap. And what's there right now is a riprap that goes down diagonally to the river at the top of which is an eight foot path and then the highway. I don't think there's much natural habitat there. I know there is. <laughs> okay, we're gonna I keep we're hearing we don't have animal time. habitat. You guys keep destroying it. And I know there's animal habitat. <coughs> what are you building in place of the animal habitat? They're not building anything. Let me go to this question over here. You made a really good question and it needs to be taken seriously. Thanks. Yes, I, I would like to raise the question. Could you stand up? Certainly, yes. That instead of regarding it as riffraff, I was shocked at this. This is the little bits of urban wilderness. The Department of Conservation and Recreation has just killed <coughs> off several here. I could not understand the person who said this is a good project and showed a picture in which the path is about six inches below where the soil is. This is ridiculous. This is erosion. Uh, this is worse than the path that was there before. And here we need the topsoil for growing things. The Department of Conservation and Recreation has taken off now twice all the wildflowers that bloomed after it ripped out the original vegetation over a year ago and has never replaced it. And here on that other side, what is called the river. But we're talking about, um, we're talking about Austin Bridge. That's right. And the area on the other side that is so what, the what is your, wilderness. What's your question? You are wanting These to are only it. questions at the moment. We're going to, if yeah. we move along, we have a whole half hour set aside for people yeah. to make but, their observations. But he's suggesting that this is riffraff. I ask him to clarify. He does yeah. not understand the ideas of urban wilderness that are vanishing and that we have climate change and we are trying to make it better, not worse. Thank you. Anybody want able to respond to Kate in particular? On plant life next to, and animal life next to the river? Well, I, I think basically I, I would say I share your overall comment or feeling that I think you are expressing that whatever <clears throat> happens with this project we need to be sure that we protect the banks of the river for their habitat value, for their water quality improvement, for their flood resilience, and for their beauty for all of us. So I, I think I agree with you in spirit. I don't, uh, Charles River Watershed Association has not created a plan or we don't endorse any of the plans yet. We're really looking forward to the environmental review process that's coming and we'll have a lot more information after the EIR about the impacts that these projects could or would have, and then I think uh, the opportunities to mitigate those impacts or look at some of the alternatives will be a lot clearer to us than they are now. Right now, we have goals and objectives. We have a lot of permits that we know would be required, but I don't think uh, we know enough to be able to say one design is going to be better for the river than another or better for habitat or uh, huh. anything else at this stage. Thank you. Renata, did you want to? 
Um, I think it's also important to look um, at mitigation efforts uh, both at the location of the throat but also look at the larger area. Are the mitigation thing, mitigation measures that could be better for the river, for the habitat? And so I think we hope that Mass DOT will study these options so we don't end up with something worse than what we have now. So we're going to have two more questions about this. Because we have to be out of here starting from like at 8.50. We have to start yeah, no, I, I know. Okay. Um, but let's take these last two, and then we'll go to uh, Harry and Steve, and then we're going to open it wide up. Yes? I just wondered, um, this is the first time I'm hearing about the landfill of the river, and I wondered if, to just to hear what are the concerns or what are the pitfalls or what are the potential problems with that, whether or do, does everyone there think it's a good idea? I'm just, I'm just interested in what should we believe, be looking at in terms of concerns about landfill for the river? Since I have the mic, I will also, but I would like others to address. Um, the moment you fill the river, the permitting is much, much complicated than if you do not hmm. touch the river. So obviously, um, it's, it would require much longer and more complicated permitting issues. So that there has to be good reasons to do it. And it has to, we have to end up with something better than we have now. But aside from the permitting though, just like, what is, it, is, there, is it bad for the river? Are there other concerns? The, the reason the permitting is difficult is it's often bad for the river. So, uh, you know, we've created at the federal and the state level and the local level as well, a lot of impediments to filling rivers. And I think that's a great thing. We need to be extremely cautious before we ever fill uh, water sheets. We, it, I mean, we have a long history of messing things up and we're spending huge amounts of time and money now trying to fix problems we made when we filled and trying to fix problems we made when we armored the banks of our rivers and urban areas. So it's, uh, there are, I don't have time to go into the details, but it's basically not generally considered a good idea to fill, and you have to do a lot of flood mitigation if you do filling. You have to look extensively at habitat issues, water quality issues. It's a, it's a long pathway, as Renata said. There's lots of permits at the federal level. The Corps of Engineers gets involved, as well as the state level, and I, I think that's a very good thing. If we are going to start looking at filling in Charles, um, you can bet I'm going to make sure every single process is carefully <laughs> gone through. And one of the points about tonight is to identify these issues and questions, but not assume that the people who happen to be here are the ones to answer them. So, I last say, quick I, one. Can it be short? Because I want to yeah. one more segment, and then we're going to open it wide up. So, okay. The question is, um, if you were to fill the river, <coughs> would that mean that you could avoid um, having to merge the traffic? Ha could you still have the traffic go from uh, Soldiers Field Road across, directly across the bridge so that traffic would not be backed up at by merging with the pike traffic and so that I'm gonna just jump in because these are not the traffic folks. Oh okay. So, okay. But but Renata, the question was really to you. I couldn't tell from your presentation whether you were uh, promoting or supporting the Charles River Conservancy, the at grade option. Yes, the are Okay, the thank grade you. Option. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Harry, you're on. Steve, you want to come up? So, Harry Madison has been, is an Austin resident, very active in the task force. And Steve is with the Little Streets Alliance. Little Streets Alliance. And uh, they're going to talk about the Austin perspective and some of the larger issues in the, you know, that have been mentioned. West Station, connectivity to through the Grand Junction to Kendall Square, sort of longer range plans. But let's start with Austin neighborhood concerns. Uh, good evening. Uh, so my name is Harry Madison, and I want to thank all of you for coming and spending your evening to talk about this project. 
and all the advocacy groups and individual people who are putting so much time and energy and creativity into organizing events like this tonight and trying to take a uh, plan that I think we all agree has a lot of room for improvement and make it a whole lot better. So I'm going to, hopefully everyone knows where this is. Uh, so does anyone look at this picture and feel really good and say, hey, this is great? <laughs> All right. So sarcasm aside. Huh? I love, I love the roads. <laughs> okay. Uh, so West Station is the idea of having a new uh, train station on the commuter rail uh, Worcester line. It would allow a whole lot of these people to not be sitting in their cars, but to be taking the train, connect Worcester, Framingham, Wellesley, Newton, and a whole bunch of western suburbs like that with Alston, as Steve will mention, and Azari described earlier, also with Cambridge, uh, and it will also help connect the booming area in Alston around the Beacon Park Yard site in Harvard and BU, and connect all of those sites with Copley and Back Bay and South Station. So if we agree the future is less of this and less you know, gridlock on the highway and air pollution and noise pollution and everything else, and it's more people taking the train, then we need to make investments now as part of this project to build West Station. So my name is Steve Miller. I'm one of the founding directors of Livable Streets Alliance. More important, I live in Cambridgeport in a house that would have been torn down by the highway. So, um, in fact, I'm not talking so much from the Alston view, I'm actually talking from the Cambridgeport view, and I'm focusing on the Grand Junction Railroad. The bridge, the path from Alston over into Cambridge. What's key to it is that it provides one of the only rail links between the north of the city and the south of the city which means that any coherent transit system is going to have to either make use of that or, I would uh, even hope more, a north-south connection between the south station and north station, which is a whole other topic. A couple of important points about mostly what the at-grade solutions will provide, but regardless of solution, something that we should be fighting for. And that is a coherent rail and trail path connection across the river using the Grand Junction Bridge. First of all, by creating that, it provides less car traffic. You're concerned about people coming off the pike and coming off Starrow Drive. There are several tens of thousands, we're not quite sure of the exact number yet, um, of commuters coming from Western Mass, as Ari talked about. Giving them a viable transit or train option will cut traffic significantly coming from the west through Alston, down the Mass Pike, and through Cambridgeport. These are people going to the Kendall Square and soon will be going to the Somerville developments that are being built as well. So less traffic. Secondly, it provides a non-car route between two of what are the big growth centers, the Harvard Yards up there, are going to be massive. Not this year, not in 10 years. Harvard has a 50-year horizon. There is going to be an enormous <coughs> amount of transportation and traffic between the Alston area of Harvard's development, MIT, and Kendall Square. It is really important there be a non-motorized connection that's direct up and down that route. Grand Junction is important for all of us living around here in order to have that non-motorized connection. It could also, and will, if done right, provide access to Cambridge people to the bike and uh, pedestrian paths on the other side of the river, much more directly than we now have. If you walk over the BU Bridge right now, it's quite a ways to get to down to the river. This would increase our access from this side to the paths on the other side. And finally, Ari didn't get into the, the details of his, but one of his incredibly creative ideas, he always blows me away, is to have Part of the elevated uh, platform above the highway and above the railroad tracks on the other side serve as a sort of high line, Boston High Line. Those of you who've been to Boston and to New York know the beauty of that, the views from it, which would also have the advantage of cutting noise, 
and wear and tear on the highway, noise to Cambridge, and some of the particulates coming out, but also provide some relief to providing some of the increased access along that neck, or at least parts of it, uh, for a wider bike and head access along the river. So you have views from the High Line and better passage below. So the High Line would be like a lid in the park, you're saying? It'd be an, one use of the platform that people have proposed to build above the highway and the railroad tracks. But you're only going to be able to do that if the supports for it are built in now when they're rebuilding the road. One of the problems they found with the big dig is the reason there are no buildings on top of those ramps, the entry and exit ramps, is because they weren't built in properly in the beginning. They had to retrofit them afterwards, and it cost a zillion dollars to be able to do that. In where, was, where would that deck be? Where? Yeah. We can show you maps. I, I don't want to try to describe it verbally here. So finally, um, I think it's important to, to understand that while the, a good grand junction is possible with some complications, with all of the uh, options, it is most possible with the at-grade options, and it'll probably work better. That's it. Thank you. A couple of questions of these folks, and then we're going to open it wide up on your views and issues and, and other things. This gentleman. Uh, sorry. Um, I'm still a little confused about the above-grade option and what the pros are of it at all. Because I mean, I keep hearing, and, and it sounds reasonable that the, L, the at grade ones are good, but I don't know what the proponent of the like, keeping up. Yeah, like, okay, we'll come point. to that. Let's hold that. I want to see what questions about West Station or the perspective of Austin neighborhood folks. Yes. Could so, you stand up? Sure. Thanks. So, what is your vision for the Grand Junction itself? How big is it? How many trains are on it? How often? And where does it run? in your mind compared to where it runs now? First of all, I'm not part of that detailed railroad planning process. So but you're recommending it, so I want to hear your ideas. My ideas. I think it's really vital we have a, a robust uh, rail and transit system in this region. I think if we keep relying on cars and roads, we're going to get more and more jammed up and more and more polluted. So my vision of what is necessary is an electronic EMU process back and forth. It's quiet, it's clean, it's running on most of the way on two tracks on certain spots. If West Station is done properly, you could probably get away with one track at certain tight spots near the station. Paralleled by a walking, bicycle, stroller, and roller skating path that most of the time can be relatively near and properly protected. And sometime, and they've done some studies on this, will have to be diversion to go away for about a block or so. That's my vision of it, and it's a longer description if you want to get into block by block. Other questions, comments? People who haven't spoken yet. Yes. Okay. Um, so, on Chestnut Street, this is my second comment, uh, I had a wonderful tenant who was German who would get on his bicycle, rain, snow, anything, and bike to Back Bay and then go to Providence. because. That's where his job was, and his girlfriend was at MIT. So, but how would these people at West Station get from the train to where they're going? I, I probably wouldn't bike at this point, but is there an MBTA connection, or are there buses, or something? Good question. So one thing we think is essential for West Station is that beyond being a commuter rail stop for east-west travelers, that it's also part of a uh, bus network that's connecting north and south. Uh, so that you have bus traffic that can come from, you know, like Porter Square and Harvard Square, then down through Alston, uh, stop at West Station to drop off and pick up, and then continue down, you know, Calm Ave, uh, you know, towards Longwood and Ruggles. Uh, I think anyone who's taken the 66 uh, bus knows that that's a slow and circuitous route, and here's, you know, BRT, bus rapid transit's in the news a lot and getting a lot of attention. Well, here's a place where you could actually create a pretty good stretch with dedicated bus lanes with a nice clean shot through what is going to be a huge area for you know tens of thousands of new people working and living and you know connecting Harvard at Square and Longwood and among others is you know something that people going back decades to urban ring planning have been uh, 
dreaming of, and here's a chance to get there. I'd like to open it up now um, in general. So thank you two very much. And let's have general comments, observations, questions. Gentlemen in the front row. So my name is Shams Mirza, and I have lived in Cambridge since, 40, since 1974. Uh, I know a few people here, and a few people know me, but I have always been sort of in the background because I came in 74, I was very excited, but I have observed, I'm the dissenter in Cambridge, I have observed that Cambridge, the city, is not progressive. Cambridge is a very divided city. It's only the upper class who make plans. The low class are just left out. And the DOT plan and the three options are basically combustion engine center. And that's going backwards. I love the options of the Charles River Conservancy, the, Ch the Charles River Watershed, etc. And I think filling any waterway is one of the worst ideas that anyone could think of. It's toxic for any waterway. Maybe people could join with the Hudson River watershed. People who might be able to teach Cambridge think Cambridge always feels that it has the answers and Cambridge when I came in 74 to tell people that when you go to Somerville, they would turn up their nose. Cambridge is still like that. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I was, Steve, do you want to mention the article you found in the Harvard Crimson about Steve Kaiser found an article that's really interesting about why the viaduct exists. Do you want yeah. to? Um, just very quickly, uh, 1963, the Turnpike Authority was planning to fill eight acres of the Charles River. We just give you a mic, Steve, because your voice yes. okay. drops down. Yeah, because it's really interesting. This is really interesting. The Turnpike Authority. Um, I mean, it was in there. Put the mic right on your mouth. Put the microphone next to your mouth. Okay, right here? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm usually the one who can't hear it. Um, the Turnpike Authority is going to fill in eight acres on the uh, Boston side of the river. And uh, in those days, uh, whatever the Turnpike Authority wanted to do, they wanted to take the house to do it. And the MDC stood up to this. The neighborhood of Cambridge Court stood up to that and protested it. Said, hey, you're going to fill in the river. You're going to make things bad at Magazine Beach. It was a state, um, there was a city councilor from North Cambridge who said, oh, 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 Cambridge Court, don't worry about this. Um, trust the uh, Turnpike Authority. Uh, Mr. Callahan knows what he's doing. Can you keep it short? Yes. Thank you. And the gist of the story is Callahan was beaten, the citizens won, and the river was protected. So we still have that opportunity. That was then. Cambridge has changed yeah. for the worse. Yeah. So I was going to say so much, you know, Magazine Beach is all landfill. I mean, most of it is. It was an island surrounded by marshes. Much of the Charles River is landfill. We have a lot of. Mm -hmm. uh, Carl, you can speak to that. <laughs> Carl Hadlin, inventing the Charles River. Do you want to keep the question going? The What's floor? the question? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it's not like the Charles River. Can we just do questions? Yeah. There, there, yeah. Right, I, I, I've heard really not about, about 500 acres was filled to create the Magazine Beach neighborhood and the Back Bay. And the idea that if we had the permit today, we wouldn't be able to build the Esplanade that Helen Storrow funded. All right, let's see all the hands of people who would like to speak. Yes, Henrietta. And then I want to see Janet at some point. It would be helpful, um, since we only have basically 10 or 15 more minutes at the most, just to hear in brief what the major issues are that you want to make sure that Bill and I represented the task force. Not long questions, not descriptions of problems. And if you've already spoken, for example, about habitat, I've heard that. I see the woman who's concerned about habitat speaking about that. We hear, we've heard about noise.
We, uh, so some things that have not been spoken of before, not please don't take the time, we'll brief time off with a That was a question. This not and it's to identify issues that they should deal with in the task force or with the city of Cambridge um, going forward. So it's not to have a lot of answers, but to put your issues out. Yes, the gentleman right here. Thank you. Um, a primary concern for me as a resident of Cambridge Port for 27 years is the traffic and how it's going to be addressed by the changes to the turnpike exits and entrances and store of drive. We spent a lot of time talking about other things, but to me, if we move vehicles efficiently, we are uh, creating a more healthy environment. I would really like to have a clear understanding of that traffic because we have terrible traffic in Memorial, Western River, and where I live, right next to the BU Ridge. I'd like to understand it. It's also going to be about a seven year project. What will the traffic be like for the seven years that this work is uh, going on? Traffic under construction in addition to the traffic. Yeah, what's the yes. 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 My name is Bob Lipsy Moore, I'm an activist in the 70s. Uh, in 2003, the MBTA proposed widening the Grand Junction Railroad Bridge to put in place an off ramp from the Mass Pike to Cambridge. All these lovely bike paths exactly give the power to put in that off ramp and the inner belt. I don't want an inner belt. I think the mascot is doing a good job except that left killing the right turn. And mascot is not knowing how much I was on. All right, so the right turn issue is definitely on the list. Okay. Right turn I just wondered um, about timing and the sense that West Station and gets built before some of these other things happen. In other words, that's my concern. It's like, does one thing have to happen before other things get triggered? Because I would hate to have all the highways happen, and then it's like, oh gosh, well now, whatever. So I'm just wondering if, if there's things about that. And I also am curious about how the Grand Junction Railway links to Cambridge in terms of vehicles and stuff like that, and also that that happens before Yes. So there are two issues there, both West Station and Grand Junction, right. the timing, the sequence, highways before and after right. and the just, transit. Is there a requirement, you know, to Everybody be quick, then everybody can get in. Yeah. That's the thing. The woman right back there. Yeah, I'm um, looking at climate change maps. I'm concerned. I assume that the DEIR will look at uh, the effects of uh, storm surge, although that's not supposed to affect the Charles River so much, but uh, floods and so on. So putting things in grade or assuming that you're going to uh, have these things that are said to be amenities right at the river's edge, uh, the boat section for anything, uh, you know, longer term costs, uh, construction costs, <coughs> uh, flooding and pumps and these things. So climate the change are. and all of its many dimensions and how are that And, and I, I, I would like to believe that the study will be done properly, but I am aware that the study of closing Beacon Park Yards was not done properly. Okay. Thank you. The gentleman right here. Uh, mitigation of construction noise. This is going to be a multi-year project, five, seven years, something like that. Well, do we have it up there in the, in the first, in the first yeah, list okay. of construction noise? The other is that the, I definitely think that the getting rid of the, the ramp to at River Street going west is a bad idea. I think it's just going to divert traffic to make traffic jams in other places. <coughs> going west on the star, going out, out, out mm -hmm. river and not to river Street. Right. Yes. Um, we heard a lot about bikes, strollers, joggers, buses. What about boats going down the river to take people to Kendall? Yeah. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like All right. Yeah. Yeah. So boat, will be. boat transportation. Way in the back. My um, neighbor. So no, no boat. Um, I actually haven't heard anything about buses um, and pedestrians. Um, bikes, yes, but there are a lot of buses needed to run between Cambridge and 
Alston because Harvard's going to be bifurcated and people will be moving back and forth. So dedicated bus lane. Dedicated bus lane, then the bus routes through this new area with its new grid of, of streets. All right, how many people want to make a comment, an issue, to identify an issue that's not up there? Yes. I just want to say that some of us do have to drive, and we do own cars, and I'm really concerned about that new traffic pattern getting off the mass pipe, getting into Cambridge. Yeah, we have, we're, we're, on, we're on it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, on new issues, nobody has brought up, sorry, uh, nobody has brought up the matter that with environmental damage and climate change, the number of road lanes on the turnpike should be reduced to one each way. There needs to be only on certain days can people drive in. They need to be four people at least to each car. And this allows a completely different claim. The other question that has not been brought up, it was brought up back to front, was the person talking about having a train and a bike path. This is in the 2006 Cambridge City and the 2014 MIT report. This one is nonsense. This has to be either bonkers people, the bike path put in, you'll see you need to be a stunt rider to do it. <laughs> it seems a cheat process in which MIT and Harvard, that instead of creating a city where people who live work in the area, they are accentuating climate change and damage to people. It is a hypocrisy bit and one needs to alter what they do here and not pretend that they're doing something about bikes when in fact they're looking at doing the other. And I would ask both the <coughs> Mass Dot and the Cambridge City Council to officially have meetings and remove those reports that could not even be done by a two-year-old on it. Well, we need to get the cars off, not having more people by car. City Community Development Department is very represented tonight. I'm sure they also heard the issue of compatibility of bikes with other modes of travel and the conflict that is inherent in some of that. Yes. Um, I just wanted to, I've been living in Cambridge for 17 years. I know I look a lot younger than someone who has been, but I haven't been here for a very long time and I hope to for many decades to come. Um, I know that we've mentioned bikes and pedestrians. I am one of those people who lives in Cambridge and doesn't have a car, so it may for everyone else, I'm not taking up the streets, but I really do care a lot about the bicyclists, bicycle access to the river, especially across the river, as we've mentioned before. I know it's been put up there before, but so many people have been standing up and talking about cars. I just wanted to put in a punt for the cyclists and the hundreds of runners um, and friends that I know who are worried about that intersection when you come off of, when people come off of Starro and cross, and it's just incredibly dangerous and scary for those of us who are running. And running. That, that is being covered by all the things right. that we've I just wanted to put it like to, you want to say it again. To say it again because it's Well, let, let me broaden that issue just to get it on the table. But the whole River Street area on that other side of the river needs some study. If one of the slides showed a back. A new backway entrance to the Double Tree Hotel is an orange line. There's a potential there because that bridge, as we noted, has to be rebuilt as part of a bridge replacement, bridge revitalization program. So there's an opportunity to look broadly, I think, at that area and all the there are many issues. And you identified cyclists not only up and down the river but across the river is what I heard. Yes. So are we almost at the end? We are almost at the end. We have about five, six. I get the last word, though. Okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to say thank you. Thank you for doing thank this. Yes. Both of you, Henrietta and Bill, and everybody else. But there, there's one note that I want to um, say, and I've been attending. Uh, a number of the task force meetings since 2014 when just a few of us have been there from Cambridge that um, the BRA and Boston got a lot done 
with their city clout. And although obviously Alston has much more at stake about this whole development, um, we're not getting much clout unless we really push now. Because we're at the end of the, the two, three year planning process. So we really need to get mass dots uh, attention. Are you listening, Nate? Yeah. I'm, I'm listening. My yeah. only concern is that. Right I am talking. I'm, <clears throat> we'll hear throat> your concern plenty because you do talk and we hear you. But I am talking now about Cambridge's concerns yeah. being at the top of the heap. And that's it. I what? think this comes back to Suzanne. Why, why should it would be helpful uh, so they would, and Bill you want to say something about it. the things that the department has been doing that that community development has been engaged in this in a way that we are not generally aware of I think because that's the kind of that they've taken what they've heard of the task force and gone to meetings that that we've not been a part of because we've not been organized frankly and so this so I think we should give uh, thanks to the fact that we have a very able department that has been representing our interests and making sure that the studies that we need about traffic you know that Heidi brought up and so on that those studies are getting done uh, that the issue of noise has been put, put out there loudly um, you know and but they I, I believe that uh, the city department just like on the Boston side needs the citizens to be behind them and they need to hear from us and I think it's so important that we're all here together with a list of concerns that you know Nate can go back and say wait a minute is it, it isn't just it isn't just the uh, professionals that are saying this if we don't pay attention to this there'll be a lot more concern from a lot more people and so I think I'm very grateful to all of you who come tonight I'm grateful to all the people who spoke and, uh, and and to Kathy in particular, I want to give special credit to Please give Kathy. Kathy. Her meeting and keep it on time and get all the things in place. Kathy makes it happen. Well, and that's why we're able to work on And Dan, yeah, yeah, and wait, wait. And Jack Wofford is yeah. here. And I'm meeting a tonight. And Peter Paul Goldberg. Before we do closing, closing, closing. closing. <laughs> I did ask Jan if you would like to make a comment. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't follow Henrietta. She's, she's too good. <laughs> now, this was my first Stand deep... Oh, okay, sorry. This is my first deep dive into this. So I have a lot of the same questions. My first question to Bill was, why is everybody talking about this viaduct if nobody wants it? Um, my big picture question is, Harvard and MIT are two Cambridge institutions that are driving all this growth. No one's mentioned the Volpe Center. That's going to be bringing a whole lot of more people. So I'm with Kathy, which is, I don't know if this $320 million is only funding the I-90 portion, but I think the West Station portion needs to be funded perhaps with a public-private partnership between, we've got three major universities, Harvard, MIT, and BU, who all stand to gain and are all going to benefit from better connections. So I don't know, I mean, I'm sure they're on this committee and I'm sure conversations are happening and I'm completely behind, but that's my... Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing it. We really need to wrap up. I think if people have final great issues to just put up like a bullet form of an issue, an issue. Yes. The, um, and this follows, this follows from what Jan was saying and other people, the uh, Grand Junction Path. I'm from East Cambridge. The Grand Junction Path plus this. I think that's what I heard Steve talking about. Makes, makes, um, okay, but, okay. But that, that doesn't say specifically the Grand Junction Path, which is an actual thing. It is not just the, the Grand Junction with a capital P. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. planning to integrate with it and use this as a way to encourage the building of the Grand Junction Path. Is there a question right here? Yes. Hi, my name is Brad Bellows, and I just want to underscore the points that were made about the importance of starting with the river 
as the driver of the project and the quality of the green space on both sides of it. Uh, right now, the green strip, especially in the throat area, is really such a pitiful afterthought. And I think if you look at the Riverway, the Arborway, all the other great spaces of the 19th century uh, Boston built around its waterways, that's the mindset we should bring to this. We should start with the river and work out from there. This is a highway plan with some decoration along the edge. It's, it's not acceptable. And that cross section uh, where it's all brought down to gray, appealing though that is from any standpoints, I think it creates a, just a completely unacceptable condition along the water's edge. Uh, I want to underscore what Carl said, that uh, we have to remember the Charles River is actually a very artificial waterway. It's, it's, it's not a naturally occurring thing. And I wouldn't rule out the idea of some fill, although that's a really slippery slope. I'd rather be pushing back the rail, and the, particularly the, the turn, minimizing and emphasizing rail, as we said, and, uh, and really getting a hot, much, much, much better green space along both sides to frame our crunch. Thank you. Brief response from Carl Hagen and the DCR. The eight-foot-wide path between the BU Bridge and the River Street Bridge is easy to make fun of. But that would not even be there if John Sears had not begged and borrowed and shifted money and con connected that. Otherwise, we wouldn't even have the Paul Lilly White Path. Oh. Oh. James, last quick well, issue. Because it got brought up, but they didn't speak to it, maybe I'll ask Ari uh, on our way out. What's, where is this high line, uh, intriguing high line idea going to actually be? And the park. The ambitious looking park that I thought I saw in the Charles River Alliance proposal, I didn't understand how that fits into the highway, putting the highway at grade. It seems like there's, that needs to be better understood. All right, the, the, the issue of whether those two are compatible. And we really need to wrap up because the rules of the library are such that we all need to be out of the building by 9 o'clock. So, yeah. Kathy, do you want to say final yeah, remarks? I was just going to say thank you all for coming. Fabulous to have you here. Come back uh, to the first, April 13th. Stack your chairs, please. Please stack your chairs. April 13th, at the board.